the Dallas Mavericks score another decisive victory on the year. This is the start of a major, major statement being issued to the rest of the league. The Mavericks have won 10 out of 11. When things are bad, when you're losing to the Knicks, you drink that cheap whiskey. But when things are good, you go and raise your game with the good scotch. And that's what I'm doing here now. Excuse me a moment. That is satisfying. Ooh, that is good. All right, so the Dallas Mavericks here. Excuse my fanatical view. I was watching the game at a sports bar with some buddies. So admittedly, I'm a little bit more, uh, a little bit feeling good right now. The Mavericks get a decisive victory at home. They're 10th in 11 games, and they absolutely blow out the Pelicans. Blow out the Pelicans. How did they do it? Behind a 40 to 14 run in the third quarter. Those explosions are going to keep going apparently. So I'm just going to go ahead and turn them off. The Mavericks dominated in this game. They were already up uh, 12 points in the first half. And Luka had already continued his streak of consecutive 20.5 rebound games. 18 now making him the third player in NBA history to accomplish such a feat. He already hit that history. He didn't have to play in the fourth quarter, just like he didn't have to play in the fourth quarter a couple of nights ago because this game was done. Up 12 at half, 40 to 14 in the third quarter. Goodbye. This was a decisive Mavs victory, and it owed a lot to the bench because while Luka was special in his 26 minutes, he gives you 26 points, 9 assists, 6 rebounds on 8 of 15 shooting, only 2 of 8 from 3, but he started hot there as well. You barely had to play him. This is good load management. This kind of load management, I'm okay with. When you're just sitting a guy out completely, if he's a young player, I hate it. Unless he's nursing an injury. This is effective load management. Blow the other team out and then rest your starter in the late third quarter through the entire fourth quarter if you need him or if you don't need him, which they didn't. And that's how you that's how you do it effectively and still satisfyingly because Luka's efficiency rating is still crazy good in this game. But in the end, you're able to continue resting him and conserving him. And while some people might say, hey, let him put up these huge gaudy numbers in these games, therefore it'll help his MVP status. I, I'm not that concerned with his MVP status, frankly. First of all, I don't think this game by any means hurts him. If anything, because he was so efficient, it still looks good. Because it's like, yeah, people people will consider that in the MVP voting. They will look at it and say, hey, he put up th these numbers, which are already crazy, but he could have done it even more so had it been necessary. If it's not necessary, don't force it because voters will also look at it and say, ah, those are empty numbers in garbage time. It doesn't mean as much. I digress. This is not about the Luka MVP campaign. Uh, I will jump on that bandwagon and start making videos about that later down the road in the season. This was about the Mavericks bench having another big, big game. He's the last one on the list here, Jalen Brunson. But Jalen Brunson continued his hot game from the other night, particularly the fourth quarter. He has now made 14 consecutive buckets in this past two-game stretch here. 14 points, two boards, three assists, six of six from the field. He did work. He was two of two specifically on threes, I believe. Uh, and you got other solid production as well. 14 from Tim Hardaway Jr. 5 of 10 shooting. Pretty pretty middle of the road there. And hey, you got minutes and quality minutes at that out of the big man, Boban. 15 points and 16 boards. That I believe, I think that ties a season high in points. It is a season high in rebounds, however. That is impressive when you're able to get that kind of production out of him because, yeah, when you got a seven foot four guy who eats up space the way he does and is just the physical presence that he is, and you can just toss it to him up by the basket, why wouldn't you do it? You know, you can't do that every night with him. You can't play him heavy minutes every night. That's never been his career take. But I certainly think the Mavericks could afford to utilize him a little bit more. That said, this was a dominant, dominant game from the Mavericks bench. I think in, with like seven minutes and change, I didn't add up the exact count, but with like seven and a half minutes in the fourth quarter, they were outscoring the New Orleans bench like 47 to 14. And it was, I mean, it was crazy. The Mavericks were up 50 points at one point in this game. And Mark Followell had a great call out earlier. I took a screen cap of it as well. According to Mark Followell, this is Dallas now has wins of 48, 42, and now 46 points in this season. 
This is the first time in Mavs history they have three wins of 40-plus points. This team is crazy good. The offensive efficiency through the roof. Some people nationally, they are recognizing Luka, and that's great, but they're, they're sleeping on this bench, man. They are sleeping on it because in this game, yes, it was decided in the third quarter when Luka was a part of that, a big part of that. Sure, I acknowledge that. But this bench is not garbage. Like, you watch some people, and some people I respect on YouTube a lot, they'll they'll talk about the NBA in a more broad spectrum. They'll give Luka all the hype in the world, say he's on pace to be one of the all-time greats, but then they'll undercut the rest of the Mavs bench by calling it garbage. Dude, it's a top-five bench in the league. Top three in scoring, top three in plus-minus. Like, this is not a bad bench. Do they have a true sixth man, like singular sixth man? No. That's the one thing that they're lacking and we've talked about that. It hasn't hurt their efficiency at all. And in games like this, they showed out. In games against the previous one, uh, previously the Timberwolves game, they showed out. They only won that game because of the bench. And the team kept rolling tonight, or excuse me, this afternoon. Game tipped off at 1. A really weird time for a Saturday game, but I digress. The Mavericks are cooking, man. That's, that's the biggest takeaway here. The team has won 10 out of 11 games. And they are 16-6 and six overall. They are in firm possession now of second place in the Western Conference. That That is, I can't even remember the last time they were that highly uh, seeded in the playoff picture there, in the initial eight seeds of the Western Conference. Because even the last time we were good, like let's say the uh, before the Rondo trade, that team from, what was it, 14-15, that was the last time we were really good. And even then, we were still, before that trade, I think right around a five seed. So to be up that high, like in the upper echelon of the Western Conference, is really, really refreshing. And yeah, you win 10 out of 11 games. You are the hottest team in the NBA, aside from the Milwaukee Bucks, who have won 14 straight. Kind of takes a little bit of the energy out of you. You know, you've won five straight, but all the same... The Mavericks are three and a half games back of number one seed LA Lakers. And yes, that is a sizable gap this early in the season. But, you know, the Lakers racked up a bunch of wins early on. You should have beat them the first time. You were pretty much screwed out of that win. I'm not hung up on that at this point. The point is you got them back in the rematch. You know you can go toe-to-toe with them. I'm not worried about that right now. What I am a little bit interested to see is how this team continues to build on it because... Some of the guys that were red hot for this team, Tim Hardaway Jr. has re- uh, receded back to the mean of where his typical production is for his career. And Seth Curry, he had a really good game the other night. He had 11 points again tonight. A lot of that in garbage time, though. So I can't really say, hey, Seth Curry had a big game. He did it in garbage time when the game was already decided. So you got guys like that who can give you that kind of production. In this case, the bench as a whole kind of acted as it. Brunson acted as it as well. And so the trend continues. You don't have that true go-to six-man, but you do have all these other positions as well that you can look to and for whom you can go to production when you put up a a near 50-point beatdown on another rival in your division here. As I said earlier, this is uh, Slam who had this notification on this. Luka is now the third player in NBA history to put up 20 points, five rebounds, and five assists. I I forgot earlier to include that last mention in 18 straight games. One of three to ever do that. That's pretty impressive stuff. Luka, when he left the game, Mavs were up 34 points. There was never any need at all to lean on him in that way. This team is clicking, and it doesn't matter. I know some people are still going to look at this, and they're still going to say, well, KP had a very ho-hum game. I didn't put KP up there. I could have put him up there. The point is, KP, KP is having a, a really... It's a different season by his standards. He has really transformed his game since coming to the Mavericks. And there's a great piece in The Athletic. If you you don't have The Athletic, I posted it in the community tab as well of the Dallas Prospect channel. Check that out. KP's, uh, what is it, Unicorn 2.0, how KP changed his game for the Mavericks. And basically, he's just bought into everything that Rick Carlisle and Cuban are selling. And the fact that the Mavericks are winning, even though his production isn't personally where he wants it, and he understands some nights he's not going to get as many touches as he's accustomed to, he's completely bought into this because the team is winning. If the team was struggling mightily and he was performing like this, I think you would see maybe some frustration. But the fact that you can have a max-level guy 
uh, making those kind of concessions and doing what's best for the team, especially for a guy that we've we've heard from Knicks fans and their organization is selfish and very much about himself and his own numbers. It couldn't be further from the truth based on what we're seeing here. Here's some great quotes from that as well. This is uh, Mark Cuban talking about KP in that article. He says, KP, and excuse my French here, KP impacts motherfucking games, Cuban said. It's obvious. He does that all the time with his defense, his spacing, his shooting, his rebounding. It's not just points with him. There's rebounds he's getting that in the past two years we're just not getting as a team. Yeah, I would say so. And KP, for what it's worth, he's looking over at Luka and he he appreciates what everything he's doing is. He says, hey, Luka's doing his best to try and keep me involved in everything. He's doing a lot to help put me in my best situations to try and succeed. And with time, I... You know, I expect to do that. But right now, we understand the the offense is pretty much get the ball to Luka, watch him go. And are you watching what he's doing? It's ridiculous. KP fully on board with the Luka hype train in this regard. He understands that this is Luka's team and that Luka is the, the alpha dog for this team. But you know what? It's a quality team from top to bottom. Like, I know we talk a lot about Luka and for very good reason, but I don't ever want to sell short this team as a whole. This team has a lot of different guys you can roll out there to get production. Uh, other guys you can call out in this game here. KP, 20 minutes. So again, a good light load for him. Now the Mavericks do play again tomorrow. They host the Sacramento Kings. That was a team just outside the playoff chase last year. They started slow this year. have been much better since that time. I don't know where they rate currently in the West. Let me double check that. They're 8-13, and 13, so they're 12th in the West right now. So they're not right at the cusp, but they're still a team you got to look out for a little bit. Uh, in that situation there, I don't know if we'll see KP. It's another back-to-back, even though this is a lighter load. The Mavericks have had a lot of games in a short amount of time. They had a back-to-back earlier this week, a few days off. Now here's another back-to-back, so we'll see what they end up doing for KP if he plays tomorrow. But he had 20 minutes, 13 points, 5 rebounds, 2 assists, only 4 of 11 from 3, or excuse me, from the field. 0 of 3 from 3, no block. So it, it's a ho-hum game for KP personally in this regard. Uh, I'm not worried. I'm still of the belief that it's going to take up to, even my talking about January, I think you'll see him start to turn a corner. But as far as regaining complete form, I think that might take the entire year, honestly. And I'm not going to sweat it if it does, because this team is showing right now that even with KP what defensively I think he's probably about what he was if not better than he was with the Knicks offensively is where he's not where he needs to be overall I would say if you're telling me KP is 70 or 75 percent of his total production then yeah I'm gonna say if I'm getting that percentage out of Porzingis in terms of his his ability to impact games on both ends of the floor the way he did before and he's still giving us the kind of production he's giving us and the team is still winning at this ridiculous rate, then yeah, we're going to be just fine. So I'm not sweating that. I'm very content right now with the state of the team. Uh, let's see here. Other other shout outs on this here. I called out Hardaway's 14 points. Bobin, I called out his great game. You also had solid performances from uh, Seth Curry, 11 points. Again, a lot of that in garbage time. Justin Jackson chipped in seven points. Basically just a quality game from the Mavericks. They shoot 53% from the field. The Pelicans only shoot 36%. Their head coach and some of their veterans like J.J. Redick are kind of beside themselves after the game, basically saying they didn't even compete. They didn't even try. They were basically just worn down and kind of just resign in the second half once Dallas started pulling away. Dallas shoots 34% compared to just 9% for the Pelicans. 3 of 32. Wow. That is a team that certainly shoots a lot better than that from 3. Uh, free throws, Dallas shot 31 free throws, 25 of 31, very solid production there, 81%. Pelicans also go 81%, but 17 of 21, so Dallas wins that edge there. Turnovers, Dallas, the best team in the league in terms of fewest turnovers, 12 for them, 14 for the Pelicans, out-assisted them as well, 25 to 17, out-rebounded them by 21, 55 to 34, eight boards offensively each. Mavericks four blocks to two and uh, committed fewer fouls. So yes, the Mavericks are cooking right now as a team. And it's our, this is, this is really fun. This is uh, the most 
fun it's been to watch Mavericks basketball in a long time. Like I said, 14-15 was the last time we had an elite offense. We couldn't stop a nosebleed defensively, but at least we could score with any team in the league back then before the Rondo trade. This is different. This is a team that can defend all right. Uh, they, they've been very good, much better rebounding than I expected they would be early in the year. Early in the year, it was a little shaky. They've been much better overall. Still not elite in that regard, but much better, much more so in the middle of the pack, which is what I think they need uh, playing above their heads, what I thought going into the year. Uh, great at second chance points. They're good on the offensive glass. And when the other team turns it over, they're making them pay. They are converting that two buckets on the other end. So there's a lot to look at with this team. And Jalen Brunson and Carlisle and Cuban and others have talked about kind of the chemistry of this team. We saw it with the preseason trip to Miami, the team dinners and photo ops. We saw it with Dirk's retirement thing last year. This team is very much knitted together. They are very much uh, on the same page and play very well for each other in that regard. So Let's see what they can do, man. I, I'm The more this season has dragged on as we've gone through these past couple weeks and they've been on this crazy tear, the more I'm now doubting if I even want to tweak that formula at all with a trade at the deadline. Because even if you're just bringing in one new part and sending one or two smaller parts out the door, let's say like a Covington, for instance, from Minnesota. He had a great game against us the other night. Let's say you could get a Covington if it's going to cost me like a Jalen Brunson and I don't know, uh, another guy off the bench or something, uh, and you know, a draft pick, I, I don't know. I don't know what I, I what I want to do for that. Um, how much I want to mess with the formula of what we got, because you see these guys all really rallying around each other. They all genuinely seem to like each other. So unless you're telling me I can ship out a Courtney Lee contract, uh, and, uh, maybe, maybe, a Tim Hardaway contract in exchange for a Covington. I don't know that I want to tweak the formula too much. I don't want to lose a Brunson. I don't want to lose, certainly don't want to lose a Justin Jackson. But we'll see. That's that's off a little ways anyway. My point being, I'm happy with the state of this team, and we learned in 1415 how you can have every how you can have a very, very good team, and you can be like, oh, we're so good, but we're not quite where I want us to be. What if I just tweak this piece here and, oh, no, it's a house of cards and everything comes crashing down. I don't want to do that this year. This year, I think I'd almost rather see this team run out the entirety of the season. And, uh, you know, we'll figure out in the offseason what we need. This isn't even supposed to be the year we compete, uh, like contend, I should say, really. Like, this is just the let's build chemistry year. Let's see what we got year. So being in the playoffs, assuming health and everything, knock on wood, permitting all of that in the playoffs, let's see where we stack up against some of these teams. Based on what I've seen so far this year, we can go toe-to-toe with anybody in the Western Conference, save for maybe the Clippers. And even then, I would say we felt that way about the Lakers and the Spurs in 2010-2011 and uh, ended up not having to face the Spurs in the playoffs because they got bounced in the first round by the Grizzlies, upset no one likes to ever talk about the Spurs being a one seed, being upset in a seven-game series by an eight seed. They only like to talk about us. I get it. We were first. Not history you want to make, but I digress. Uh, we had gotten our asses beat by the Lakers in the matchups, regular season matchups that year. And what happened in the postseason? Oh, yeah. We swept them. We swept the two-time defending champions, the three-time, the three consecutive Western Conference champions, and we sl- swept legendary NBA coach Phil Jackson, into retirement first time in his entire career he'd ever been swept so yes this team very good i like what i see i don't want to tweak too much but that's going to do it for my time guys i'm ddp don't forget to like this video uh leave a comment below subscribe to the dallas prospect and until next time remember every legend was once a prospect salute and my outro broke wait for it Salute.